Hey guys, uh, welcome to today's class. And today we are going to talk about uh, so we are going to be talking about the FUMO definition. We are going to talk about the FUMO definition of a limit. Now you have to remember that the previous definition we gave you is actually known to the formal definition of the limit. The definition we gave you is called the informal definition of the limit because it has words like uh, approach and so on. So in mathematics, when they say what does it mean for something to approach or to get closer? So these are going to be addressed in the formal definition of the limit. And uh, whenever someone says you can use the formal definition of the limit, you will have to state what we are giving, we are going to give you here. Remember the informal definition. Uh, informal definition uh, said that a uh, limit as x tends to c of f of x is equal to l if uh, as x approaches c, as x approaches c, f of x. Approaches L. I think we, we did this that uh, the informal definition was as x approaches the number, then f of x approaches what you call the limit of the function. But now we are going to talk about the formal definition of the limit. And uh, uh, the formal definition says that uh, suppose, uh, suppose function f. Is defined on an interval a b except except possibly at c with c in a b except possibly at c with c in a b and then we say that uh, f is said to have f is said to have limit L or to tend to limit L as x approaches C approaches C if even a number epsilon greater than zero, there exists there exists a delta greater than zero such that such that absolute of x minus c less than the delta implies absolute of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And uh, by the way, when you say x minus c less than delta, because delta is some small number greater than zero, it means that x is approaching c. And when you say fx minus l, I use the l so that people don't confuse. Uh, so that people don't... Uh, then I use the same f, and then fx minus l less than epsilon, epsilon is also some small number, then this is actually what it means for f of x to approach l. So this means fx is getting closer to l, this means that x is getting closer to c, or we are in the neighborhood of c, we are in the neighborhood of l. And uh, you can tell that this is denoted We can say that uh, this is denoted, of course, as before. This is denoted by limit as x tends to c 
of e from x is equal to l, like before. Of course, there are some remarks you can make from this definition. Uh, for some of you, the definition might seem vague, so uh, there are some remarks you can make. And then one, uh, not the words except possibly at C. Uh, except possibly at C. No, so we have said that in the definition that F is defined on an interval AB except possibly at some point C in AB. And you guys remember that before we computed the limit of f of x is x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. And I told you that this function is not defined at x is equal to 2, but the limit at x is equal to exists, and that limit is 4. So the function does not need to be defined at the point you're computing the limit, and that does not stop it from having the limit at that point. So that is basically what this one says. This means that it is not necessary. This means that it is not necessary um, to have f defined at x is equal to c for f to have a limit at C. That is one thing. Uh, and two, we said that the inequality, the inequality x minus C less than delta also means also means that we are we are considering x near c but not at c because this is a strict inequality it means that we actually and also d is something positive is some number bigger than zero means that we are considering x near c but not at c because if x is at c then this is actually going to be zero or x minus c will be zero now uh, another three that remark that remark is uh, the third remark is that uh, uh, this definition is fulfilled if if for each or for any epsilon greater than zero we can come up with the delta if for each epsilon greater than zero we can come up with a delta greater than zero such that absolute of f of x minus l is less than epsilon whenever x minus c less than delta. And we said that uh, this definition fails or lame as x tends to c of f of x. This definition fails or the limit is not L if for just if for just one epsilon 
uh, if for just one epsilon greater than zero, we cannot we cannot find a corresponding delta greater than zero for which this statement holds. And now the, the first one, the first remark is that the delta the delta one finds is dependent on epsilon but not is dependent on epsilon but not unique. Uh, of course, uh, you, the delta you find always depends on the epsilon, but you don't necessarily have to come up with the same delta. It also depends on how, which steps you take to find the delta. And uh, uh, we said that uh, as epsilon as epsilon gets smaller. As epsilon gets smaller, the corresponding the corresponding delta becomes smaller. This one you you see what you mean by that, and also another. Another remark we can make is that uh, uh, for a fixed for a fixed epsilon is equal to epsilon naught, if a corresponding if a corresponding delta is equal to delta naught is found is found then uh, then any delta smaller than delta naught works if you can find one delta then someone taking any other delta smaller than the delta you found actually works. And uh, maybe I, I, I'll do an example for some of you to, to see what we are doing here. So let's do some example. Uh, it's proof. I'll put it up here. An example is that prove that the limit as x tends to 1 of a 2x plus 1 is equal to 3. Let us, for example, do this. When they tell you prove that the limit is 3, of course you're not going to just substitute in x is equal to 1 here and you say 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3, so proof. Uh, we are going to use the formal definition of the limit. And um, how do we proceed? We are going to use the definition. So the de definition says that given epsilon greater than zero, we can find a delta greater than zero. Remember the definition says there exists. So when you're proving, you say we can actually find that delta which the definition says exists. You can find a delta greater than zero such that absolute of x minus c less than a delta implies that f of x minus f is less than epsilon. But you have to remember what is the c. This c from what we are proving is the one which is equal to 1, whereas this f of x, from what we are proving, is the 2x plus 1, 
and then this L is the 3. So in other words, this is what we should have written, that we can find a delta greater than 0 such that absolute of x minus 1 less than delta implies that 2x plus 1 minus 3 is less than epsilon. Now, we already start with this and try to see if we can conclude the delta from there. Now, absolute of 2x minus 1 plus 1. Absolute of 2x plus 1 minus 3 is the same as the absolute of 2x plus 1 minus 3, so this becomes minus 2. And you guys know that this is the same as 2 absolute of x minus 1. That is basically what we have. And we say that, uh, remember we require this to be less than epsilon. So we require this to be less than epsilon. Uh, so, absolute of f of x minus l will be less than epsilon if two brackets x minus one is less than epsilon or absolute of x minus one less than epsilon over two. Or here by dividing by two by two, you will say that this is the same as x minus one less than epsilon over two. Remember, we can say that uh, Remember, we are looking for a delta for which, remember we are looking for a delta for which absolute of x minus 1 is less than a delta. Now if you compare this with this, uh, we can say, Thus, choose delta to be equal to epsilon over 2. Because you have to compare this with this. It means that we are looking for a delta for which this x minus 1 is less than delta. But here we already have that x minus 1 is less than epsilon over 2. So we can say that choose this to actually be the delta that we are looking for. And actually, when you find the delta, then you have completed the proof. So, finding the delta proves that what you were given is actually true. Now, let us do another example. minus a less than delta implies uh, uh, that sine x minus sine of a less than epsilon. Remember this is your f of x, this is your l. This is your x, this is your c. So let's carry. And we now start with this. Now, absolute of sine x minus the sine of a 
is equal to you guys can use some trigonometric proof the sine minus sine is 2 cos sine is the absolute of 2 sine x minus a over 2 cos x plus a over 2 and we know that this is actually less or equal to 2 if we replace the cosine with the 1 because remember the cosine is between negative 1 and positive 1 so if we replace this with the 1 we just say less or equal to uh, 2 absolute value of the sine of x minus a over 2 and this is because the less or equal to sine comes because I've replaced the cosine with the 1 but now you have to recall, you say that recall that uh, the sine of x is less or equal to x. For x in radians, we always have this. And therefore, we say this is less or equal to 2 absolute value of x minus a over 2. Or our say this is less or equal to. 2 absolute value of x minus a over 2 because uh, because we are saying that the sine of x minus a is less or equal to x minus a find angle in radians and therefore what is this this is equal to the 2 goes with this so this becomes x minus a and therefore what do we have uh, therefore we have absolute of sine x minus sine a less than less or equal to absolute of x minus a and remember remember we are looking for a delta for which for which absolute of sine x minus sine of a uh, uh, for which maybe I'll, I'll say this for which x minus a less than a delta implies that the absolute of sine x minus sine of a less than epsilon so because we require this to be less than epsilon we require sine x minus sine a to be less than epsilon and now we are looking for delta for which x minus a less than the delta by looking at this inequality it means that the epsilon can actually be the delta so we can say plus choose delta to be equal to epsilon. And by you choosing the delta to be equal to epsilon, then you would have uh, then you would have proven this. So you guys can try this. You guys can try this when you get time. But use the formal definition of a limit to prove that A by the limit as x tends to 3 of x plus 3 is equal to 6 b limit as x tends to 1 of 2x minus 3 with negative 1 c is the limit as x tends to 4 of 7 minus 3x is equal to negative 5 and uh, D 
plus 3 is the limit as x tends to 2 of 3x plus 5 is equal to 11. So you guys can uh, try that. And now we have one last theorem before we end this class. And that is uh, about uniqueness of limits. So we have the theorem um, which says that the limit of a function at a given point If we take this is unique. So whenever you find one limit, then that is the only limit. You don't need to find other limits. And uh, there is a proof. Uh, uh, maybe we can give the proof. Uh, uh, of course, when you're proving uniqueness, then you have to assume that there are two limits. And then you show that actually these two limits are equal, which implies that the limit is 1. So we can say that suppose, suppose limit as x tends to uh, c of f of x is equal to l1, and limit as x tends to c of f of x is also equal to L2. So suppose there are two limits L1 and L2. Then since L1 is a limit, then by the definition we say that given epsilon greater than zero uh, there exists a delta 1 greater than 0 such that absolute of f of x such that x minus c less than a delta 1 implies that uh, f of x minus l1 is less than epsilon over 2. Uh, we could, of course, have used epsilon 1 and then say epsilon 1, or we can just say epsilon over 2. And we said that because L2 is also a limit, because L2 is also a limit, and we said that Given the same, given the same epsilon, because L2 is also a limit, then given the same epsilon, there exists a delta 2 greater than 0, such that absolute of x minus c less than delta 2 implies that f of x minus L2 is also less than epsilon over 2. Now, you can say that let delta be equal to the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2, which is the smallest of the two. So because delta is the smallest of the two, then remember, we said that if one delta works, then a small delta works. So it means that this delta will actually apply work on both of these. And therefore we say, then, thus, if x minus c is less than the delta, 
both fx minus a1 is less than epsilon over 2 and fx minus l2 is also less than epsilon over 2. So it means that this delta actually makes these two to hold simultaneously. And now, what does this imply? Now, what is the difference between L1 and L2? Because we have to show that L1 is equal to L2. This can actually be written as L, L1 minus f of x plus f of x minus L2. And by the triangle inequality, this is less or equal to absolute of f of x minus L1 plus absolute of f of x minus L2. I have of course swapped these because when you take the absolute signs, it doesn't matter which one you start with. And we said that this is actually less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is equal to epsilon. Uh, and by the way, if you have L1 minus L2 less than epsilon, because epsilon is any number bigger than 0, then this one can only be 0. Because that's the only way this will be true. So we say that is for any given epsilon greater than 0, absolute of L1 minus L2 is less than epsilon, which implies Absolute of L1 minus L2 is equal to 0, hence L1 is equal to L2. Hence, the limit of a function is unique. This, is, this actually proves that the limit of a function is unique. So this will end our class for today. And then uh, next time we shall start on uh, differentiation, which many of you have been uh, waiting for. <laughs>